Hello, everybody, and welcome into Grow Live. I am your host, Katie Dubow, and it's May 3rd, right? Which means it's Garden for Wildlife Month. Yay! So what does that mean? What does that mean for our wildlife? What does that mean for our gardens? What does that mean for you? Well, I've got the lovely Heather Wheatley here with us to talk all about it. Hey, Heather. Hi, how is everyone? We are so excited to have you because Garden for Wildlife Month, a name like that is confusing because it's like, am I gardening for the deer? Am I gardening <laughs> for the rabbits? Am I gardening for the hummingbirds? So sure. we are so excited to have you, especially because many of you who tune in are based in the Maryland area. So you want to know, gardening is so regional, right, Heather? I mean, it is um, such absolutely. a- Absolutely. You know, we, some of it, houseplants, not so much. No. That's that can get down to your individual rooms in your house. That you That's know, right. sometimes the climates there are so different. But it's so regional. So we're so glad to have somebody who was. Are, actually, were you born in Maryland? Where Where were you born? I was born in Annapolis, Maryland. But I lived in thirteen states. I went to eleven schools, not including universities. So I am uh, very keen on knowing what eco region I'm in. So it's an important subject. It's a really important subject. So we'll hear from Heather all about um, what it means to garden for wildlife. So and how to attract the ones that we want in our yards and really how to manage, as Heather and I were, were talking beforehand, the ecosystems right. that are around our homes to make them the best that they can be, both for your enjoyment and for the wildlife. So I'm really excited. So tell us where you're listening from. What what region are you tuning in from? I know we often get a lot of people from Maryland. Um, so let us know where you're tuning in from and we'll take it from there. And please okay. help us by sharing this video. It really does help spread the message yeah. and spread that education. Yeah, hopefully we'll get some people from um, Delaware too because we're now doing business in Delaware, which is very exciting. And uh, also another vital eco region that, that um, we've been studying and, and looking through. Um, some people who live in Delaware might be familiar with the Livable Delaware um, program um, there where they have, it's similar to the work that we've done in the Native Habitat Center, um, where they picked out eco-regional plants that provide the most habitat, um, heal the land, um, promote stewardship for the future of Delaware. Um, so we're very excited to be doing business in Delaware because our message, I mean, basically we have a matching ethos. Yeah. So it's exciting. It is exciting. I cannot wait to visit. And I know that it's open, the garden center yeah. there now. Yeah. So yeah. I can't wait to visit because it's a little yeah. closer to me than the the region, the locations in Maryland. But either yeah. way, you you know and love Homestead. We've got a Southern Marylander oh, yeah. Jill tuning in. We've got DC. Hi, um, yeah, welcome. So please, we want to also answer your questions. So that's what we're here to do. Yeah. Heather is a plant fanatic. Um, you probably don't go an hour. I was going to say a day without talking about plants, but you oh, probably yeah. don't go an hour without talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Talking about plants, um, you are a certified professional horticulturist and yeah. the education coordinator at Homestead. So do you go between all three locations or are you mainly just in the Davidsonville location? So I go to all of the locations, um, but, you know, in the era of Zoom, um, it's easier to do right now. Um, but I have been um, in the Delaware store for the last two weeks, so I, I float through all of them. So. It is uh, lovely in this era of Zoom. We get a lot of people from Maryland who tune in, but then mm -hmm. we also get uh, people who would never have been able to have the experience of being in Homestead right. and gaining the education from people like you. So I think right. there, this is a beautiful thing that we get to educate you guys. Um, yeah. And hey, Emily, it looks like your coworker, Emily, is tuning in. Hi, Emily. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you're right. So it is important that, um, you know, people come into the store and experience you know, the, the homestead experience, it's agro experiential. Um, but our whole mission, like our whole value is connecting people to plants. So if we can do that face to face and you come in and pick up plants, great. If we can educate you on selecting the right plant material, um, it doesn't have to be from us. It should be because we can give you provenance and we can assure that, um, you know, we've made the best selections for you. Um, we have an incredible plant warranty. We have a lot of, of value at Homestead, but what is most important to us is connecting people to the right plants. 
So this is a great opportunity to do that. So thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad that I could be the connector. That's what I love. <laughs> um, so let's start there about your love of plants. Um, um, because you do. I mean, when talking to you, you it's infectious, the love that you have oh. for plants. Where did that start from? Um, well, so I'm not sure if there's like a, a, a gene or a cell. I'm not sure, but I was born that way. Like I came out with two green fists and I was ready to, you know, seize the world. But I, my grandmother, um, Hildreth Morton, um, fostered that love for plant material um, because I've lived all over. We used to summer um, in Davidsonville at on my grandmother's farm. And I remember, um, you know, for years just waiting for summer so that I could go, you know, barefoot and run through the grass. And she had beautiful meadows and in the greenhouses, the glass greenhouses. And I could ask any question and she would have the answer. Mm. And it was amazing. And so then I, I thought, okay, well, this is the life for me. And she's like, no, you'll starve and die. <laughs> I said, that's it. I'm doing it anyway. So. So was she in um, the business? Yes. So um, Bittersweet Hill Nurseries is, uh, was a, a nursery in Davidsonville. She was one of the first um, female tobacco farmers, actually, only because she bought a farm that had tobacco on it. And so she, she let that year go through and then she sold the tobacco and bought greenhouses and filled it with tomatoes and zinnias. And then as that went on, then probably within 15 years, she was the leading purveyor of herbs um, in the state and then um, aquatic plant material. And so she founded the International um, Water Garden Society, which is really cool. I love those things. And Wow. She, yeah. Yeah. It was very cool. But I'll tell you, my relationship with her wasn't, I mean, obviously she, I learned a lot about herbs and, and, you know, essential um, edible things that you could grow. But um, I think I connected with her through trees. Um, although I'm a, a very serious perennial grower, I remember when I was little and we were going down the road, um, her road actually on Governor's Bridge, and I saw these trees clinging, like heaving, clinging onto the little bit of soil that was left on the sides of the roads. And I thought, I'm never going to see these trees as an adult. These are going to be gone. Look at them struggle. And just a couple of weeks ago, um, I was reflecting on what she was saying. And she said, you watch, you watch. They have a resilience. They have a willingness to live and they will be here for you as an adult. And sure enough, they are still there. I was there. Um, yeah, there they are. Look at that. I mean, they're Amazing. gnarled and there's hardly any soil and they just, they're clinging but there they are. They're part of a system, a community that, um, you know, feeds on each other and they're all native trees. So they do have that built in resilience. And she was, mm -hmm. right. she was right. right about most stuff. That's beautiful. And I love the history. So are any yeah. of you also some people who are tuning in from Maryland or wherever you live? Do you know the history of your area? You shared with me that um, farming in Anne Arundel County book. And I just want to post it because you guys, I know you probably yeah. all love history as much as I do. Um, I just shared the link to that. Is this where this picture comes from? That book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's my grandmother. She's so beautiful. And all of those are geraniums. And um, that was the second crop after the zinnias and the tomatoes that she was growing to to um, make enough money so that she could build up her business. Yeah, she so was that's very you in that yeah. picture. Yeah, see where it says Heather Ann Drenner. That's my maiden name. Amazing. And so, yeah. did she have a partner for the greenhouse, or did it was all her business? Yeah. It was grandma just her? Wow. I love yeah. that. People yeah. are saying great story. It is. It's true. Um, yeah. Donna Mandel Raynor is saying she used to babysit two of her grandchildren, one being be your grandmother's namesake. Oh, my cousin Hilly. Yeah. So she probably babysat Yates and Hilly, who Yates is a farmer in Southern Maryland. I'm telling you, it's there's a gene. It's got to be a gene because my Hildreth's father was the agricultural ambassador for the U.S. to um, Venezuela. And it goes on. I mean, I think the, his father was an ichthyologist, but we're all connected to nature in some way. 
it's so good. <sighs> I love it. And I've never heard the term a green fist, but oh, I like yeah. it and I'm going to yeah. adapt it now too. And it's many yours. of you probably there, yeah, are saying you, you know, tell me if you have green fists out there. So yeah. I love yeah. that. You're right. You know, some of it's in our blood. And so many people, when I ask them that question, it is a grandmother or an older figure yeah. in their lives. And yeah. so now reflecting on that, um, thinking about who can you be that influence for? Oh, you know, yeah. what young kids, I know you've got grandkids, are they into mm -hmm. plants? Oh yes, oh totally, yes. Uh, my daughter just put up her first greenhouse. She's so excited, um, but I still have to talk with her because she put up this gorgeous pool and she put up a greenhouse and she has a shed and she's planted maybe three trees and she has a huge backyard. And so more trees, we need more trees, we really do. Well, why do we need more trees? Well, for that very reason that you saw on the side of that hill, right? So you can see that that hill is being held back um, by those trees. So it's soil conservation. It's, you know, nutrient conservation. Um, all of that understory is part of the community of that tree. So if that tree were gone, um, that understory wouldn't do well. That side of the road would wash away. I mean, it's essential, it's essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's habitat involved here too. So it's not just um, for the love of trees, although I think that's a fine reason to do anything. Um, it's also for habitat. So we have, you know, the Eastern Bluebird, which, you know, in my younger days there, I mean, they were in, you know, short numbers and we've, we've done everything that we can to bring them back. But then there's also, you know, the monarch decline and the, um, you know, the less and less caterpillars and more and more predatory insects like bagworms and things like that that are coming up. So if you don't put these trees in, if you don't make a conscious effort to put them in or preserve the ones that you have, which I learned working at Longwood Gardens, is that preservation as it is as essential as putting in new ones. Mm. Um, then, then, I mean, I don't want to be gloom and doom, but I feel like, you know, we would be lost. Our, you know, this little bit of earth in this little bit of time that each of us have to be here as a steward, um, you have an imperative. You have an imperative to put in trees, even if it's one tree. My backyard is 10 feet wide. Like I can almost, if I were a little bit, I could touch my house to the neighbor's Wow. Side. I have no kind of yard, but I have nine trees. They're all... Um, fastigit, which is like the narrow columnar trees. So um, I have some, I have two ornamental trees, but the rest are native. And I have the ornamental trees because I, for habitat sake, I put in an apple tree, a malice. It's called, um, oh, I should have written that down. North Pole, North Pole. So it's really narrow. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't eat the apples. I let the flowers bloom for early pollinators. And then I let the apples fall for, we have squirrels here, um, sure. all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. but also, you know, wasps get into the fallen apples. That's a beneficial insect. So I provide habitat in a 10 foot by 60 foot area um, with trees. Well, obviously I put in understory plants because I'm, I think most people know, and if you don't, I will share with you now, plants like to live in a community, mm -hmm. right? Just like people. The only, the difference between a tree and me is the shape of my cell. I, I could be a talking willow right now if I had square edges to my cells. Almost everything inside the, the plant cell and the human cell is duplicated, right? There's four things that separate us besides- Yes, but we love to be in a community and we love to share um, information and resources. So do plants. So when you put in a bunch of trees and you put in an understory and you keep the ground moist and you have the right soil type and you should know your soil type. And I can, there's a test for that. Um, I can share with you in a second, but just remember that they live to live in communities because if you put in one tree, which is great, do that if that's all you can do that. But that tree will live a lot longer if it has four or five of its friends sharing a network of nutrients, of information, um, of um, climate control. Mm -hmm. Building in a community is, is the way to go. Mm -hmm. so, um, but I will real quick address soil types. So if you yeah. have a mason jar, 
you're going to fill it. You're going to dig down on the ground about six, eight inches, maybe about where roots would be early um, and fill up that mason jar halfway and then fill the rest of the jar up with water and put the lid on and shake it and put it on the counter. Go fix a cocktail or whatever. And then by the time you come back, you'll see three striations and it will tell you your texture, your soil type. So you'll have clay and silt and sand. Mm -hmm. And one of those is going to be heavier than the other. And so if you have a lot of sand, I have amazing plant lists where you can plant in sand. I know where you are, Katie, you have, I mean, that's clay central up there. So I can give you a, a list of plants that, that um, can live in the clay. So you can either use that information and then find out what plants love that because I believe love the one you're with is the way to yeah. go, right? You can augment your soil, you know, sideways, you know, and make anything grow in there, but you will be doing that forever. And that's not sustainable. So I think that's, that's a great that. tip. I yeah. love that DIY yeah. little mason yeah. jar tip mason because jar. I think everything starts in the soil. Everything starts there. Yeah. And so if you don't understand what you're working with, then how can you be successful? And right. so that's what we want. That's the whole purpose right. of this is for you to be successful growing what you love. And so I love yeah. that tip. Go out and do yeah. that tonight or today, right oh, on right yeah. now. Stick, stick with yeah. us. But. Yeah. And if you've already done it, way to go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. we have trees. Go mm -hmm. ahead. No, I was just going to say that's the, you know, part of the mission of connecting people to plants is that we don't grow gardens. Homestead doesn't grow gardens, but we do grow gardeners. Yes. And the success of that gardener depends absolutely at the foundation level of what your soil is. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Grow more gardeners. I love it. Kelly's yeah. saying that she has lots of trees and soon she's going to be in a forest. She's in Northwest Kansas. So yes. Kelly, we'll get to your understory. She's looking for plants to plant under her trees. Um, oh, yeah. So let's talk quickly more about some other trees. So you <laughs> talked about the native trees. So what are some of those big trees that we should be planting? Well, so we built the Native Habitat Center based on the research of many, many scientists. But we basically, um, if you read the work of Dr. Talame, Doug Talame, um, he has the most comprehensive list of um, trees that provide habitat and what the habitat is. So yes. our state tree, not to brag, is the oak tree, which is singled out in his work as one of the most valuable trees. Um, and so I highly recommend putting in an oak tree. So I have an oak tree in my little 10 foot area. Amazing. It's also a fastigit. It's a Corsus uh, rubor, rubor. Yeah, um, but it just it's just a columnar oak. And I have caterpillars all the time. I have spider webs all the time. I have, um, Birds. Birds that think that they can light on the little narrow things, but it's great because they're trying to get to the caterpillars and that, you know, multiple levels of habitat there. But the oak is a great tree. It really is. And most every state has some kind of oak that does well. You know, there's yeah. a, you know, Western, they're, they're everywhere. They so are. it depends on the, con on the where yeah. you are and find the one that's native to you. Yeah, I love that. So then let's talk, let's go to more of the understory because of these communities. I think people have such trouble putting together gardens. So what are examples of understory? You know, we've got our oaks and then what are some more yeah. understory natives you would suggest? Um, so, so that really depends on, on um, what you like, but I love the um, oak leaf hydrangea. I think mm. it's very handsome. It grows um, in a nice form, a spready form, which is great because then birds and, and small um, animals can can go underneath or um, it also shades out weeds. So I, I guess mm. yeah, any any plant that does double duty like that or triple duty in this case, I'm mad for um, because if I never have to see mulch from my drive to work to my home, I would be delighted. Wouldn't that be amazing? That be. day will come. Is coming. I, it is because you can see companies, um, you know, the the finer horticultural companies, the growers like North Creek Nursery or Kurt Blumel or you know any of the the ones that that really are that care about the environment and they really support ecosystems and things like that. They're constantly listing green mulch, you know, plant material that can go under the understory. Mm -hmm. um, that you don't ever have to mulch and they naturalize the area and you don't even have to think about it. 
Mm -hmm. What is the definition yeah. of understory? I mean, I know that technically means under our big trees, but that would that include smaller trees and woody shrubs? Yes. Woody's yep. and shrubs. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yep. And there are understory trees too. Any tree that stays low, you know, five foot um, is an understory tree. So um, in our area, well, this is in our area, the dogwood even acts as an understory tree. They used to be amazing, but then they, um, the the uh, dogwoods got anthracnose and we lost a bunch of them. But the ones that are coming back are much, they're smaller, mm -hmm. um, still beautiful and handsome, mm -hmm. um, an understory tree. Mm -hmm. And red buds. Mm -hmm. um, I know oh, that yeah. the rising sun red bud is one of my favorite trees. And, you yeah. know, it's these native trees that just light up they look good in three yeah. seasons some in four because of their bark and right um so those are great serena's agreeing dogwood yep, and red bud are yep. some of her favorites yep. and i'll tell you in the six foot you know in a 10 foot yard you can also do the circus candidates the red bud in a weeping form Ooh, they're natural selections and they're very narrow and they have the heart-shaped leaves and they turn purple and they're Ooh. just magic well, well, you mentioned the Native Habitat Center. So for those yeah. people who might not know, would you give us a little bit of an update on oh, what sure. the Native Habitat oh, Center is? I'm so proud to talk about this because um, it's been three years in planning. Um, and and we have um, over 320 native plants selected for our Native, native Habitat Center. Not necessarily all of them available all at once, but um, throughout the year uh, or throughout the growing season, um, we have selected um, grasses and for, uh, I was gonna say grasses and forbs, perennials, um, you know, that, that perform, you know, um, in the native ecoregion that we're in mm -hmm. um, and uh, trees and shrubs, um, some of them edible. We have the native um, pawpaw. I don't know if anyone's had a pawpaw, but it's kind of like a creamy banana type Fruit. Have you guys had a pawpaw? Yeah. Let us know because they're not in grocery stores because I guess they no. they just can't be shipped. No. There's, no. you know, I've never actually had one. I am growing no. one right. or two the trees. It's right though. You better eat it because it doesn't last. Yeah, it goes the other way really fast. And I have a friend, um, she she makes pawpaw beer. Um, it's not my favorite beer, but it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, a native fruit beer. So that's really good, you know. Um, and we have um, lots of um, uh, native trees that um, fit in small areas. We have um, grand trees, you know, obviously we have like a giant magnolias mm -hmm. that are amazing if you have a lot of property. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about native plants is it's you win. Mm -hmm. right? If you know that soil type and you come in and you say, you know, I have clay soil, I can give you so many native plants and they're mm -hmm. a great investment because guess what deer don't usually eat? Native plants because they have, that's why they're still here, right? right. Because they're resilient against that kind of predator. So it's good. I mean, That's during great. a drought, the you know the deer will eat the hair off my head. But generally speaking, you know, under normal circumstances, um, native plants are the way to go. So, so your native that. habitat center is just putting together those top plants yep. at homestead, yep. and you guys have always been focused on doing the right thing. Not just, I mean, certainly at the the store, but Maryland yeah. in itself is just way ahead of the game. Yeah. On yeah on you know banning fertilizer chemical fertilizers and inputs and things like yeah, that and yeah. and planting natives so i love that yeah. about go marylanders I know. well you know one of the things i love about this state too is they put their money where their mouth is so if you come in and buy a native tree they have a 25 dollar coupon from the state um and you send away for the, well at home said we give you the money right away. We take it right off the price of the tree, but you send it in and they give you $25 for buying a native tree for putting in a native tree. It's a Whoa. great program. Yes. So we go in to homestead, buy a native yep. tree and yep. you get $25 off right away. Yes. Thanks yes. to the department. Is it the department of natural resources or what it is? is. Yep. Amazing. Yep. Yep. And the tree programs here are also amazing. I think you might've spoken, you might have, um, spoken with people who have talked about that here, but um, the native uh, movement here is strong. It is We're protecting the largest estuary. You know, Chesapeake Bay is yes. vital to the country.
to the planet. Yeah. Um, we have a specific onus to plant native plants um, to protect that bay. So it's true. And um, I can't remember who it was I was talking to, but maybe it was Donald Pell when he was on. Yeah. And he yeah, said, it's probably. not just Marylanders job for those that I know there was a person who was tuning in from Pennsylvania. And I know there's yeah. a Kansas person. Yeah. You say Kansasian. I don't know how you would say that, but um, Kansonian. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but it is our job being upstream of these places yeah. and then people who are upstream in, of us. And it is all about you know, you alluded to this earlier, your community. And yes. my Doug, Doug talks about this in his latest book, creating that backyard park. So why yes. is that concept of a backyard park so important, not just for our backyard, but for the community? Oh, well, that's a great question. And I think the understanding of this question, um, bar none, will make you make you you know, commit to doing it yourself. But if I have it in my yard and say we're neighbors and you have it in your yard and the next and the next, we're creating a causeway mm -hmm. for yes. habitat. So I can do my part and I will always do my part. But the more people that do it, um, the more that it's a community driven effort, the longer the causeway is. And, you know, migratory patterns change. If, if there's no food, they move. Mm -hmm. They they go away from where you are um, if you don't provide habitat, if you don't provide food, if there isn't water, um, they come to these causeways as you build them. So you're, I got to say, you're rewarded right away for, for making the effort. Um, but you're also... Um, you're you cause great detriment when you don't if you put a patio in your whole backyard then you you know you've made a desert right for for habitat not to mention what a way to live right not okay. my choice but not yeah choice. you know these no pollinators choice. can only fly so far or even the birds you know they can fly right. much further distances but without access to food and right. so doug in his nature's best hope book talks about yeah the parks are great our national parks are great yes. but they don't cover a big chunk of the country that right. still need those as terry's saying habitat highways you know yep. to, to the corridors the ability to stay healthy, yeah. regrow yeah. their populations. And, you know, not that it's all about us, but make our gardens more beautiful, make our farms yeah. more productive. And, you know, it's just this full cyclical effort. And it right. all goes back to that community. Facts. That is a fact. Yes. And so if you, if, if you have these causeways or high, highways that um, Terry's talking about, then, um, and there's no interruption, then they get to, big, large national parks where there are hundreds of acres where they can, you know, proliferate, where they can, um, you know, where they can, you know, hibernate, or whatever they yeah. need to do. Yeah. 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 Um, and then get back to wherever they came from um, healthfully. Because if you, if you, if, if there's no highway, you know, there's a whole barren area, they've got to survive to get yeah. to the next thing. So, I mean, we do have a responsibility. And if it starts with you, if you start from the, you know, a place of self, I want a better backyard, I want a better environment. Um, and the, the natural benefit of that is to habitat, then great, start there. But I can guarantee you're going to fall in love with the plant material that you're bringing in, the communities that you're building, the the wildlife. You know, the other day there was a terrible storm and the power was out and everybody went outside and there were birds and there. It was just amazing. It was amazing. Well, that's what you saw at yeah. the beginning of the pandemic when people stopped driving as much. You right. saw like yes. the coyotes in the streets of San Francisco yes. and the return of flamingos yes. to somewhere and dolphins in the Venice Bay, which I think that was deep that was debunked but still um <laughs> wildlife returning to the yeah. habitats that were too um you know impacted by yeah. by people uh, your sun was brighter yeah yes <laughs> um kelly is telling us it's just kansan just a Kansan. Oh, Kansan. thank you yeah. kelly thank you kelly hope, i hope we weren't offensive in any way no. educating people thank you <laughs> that's right that's right each one teach one <laughs> yes so, all right, we talked about some big native trees we love. We talked about some understory plants. Yeah. feel like you're passionate about all plants, but maybe perennials are really your your real favorite child. Um, what, is, what are some great choices for, let's say, our Marylanders, our gardens here in the region? What are some of your favorite perennials? 
Yeah. So um, I don't know if I mentioned I live on a peninsula. I'm just outside of Annapolis in Edgewater and I live on the Chesapeake. Um, and so on the peninsula, we have a lot of issues with stormwater management. Mm. I don't think we're alone in that. I think it's it's amplified here, but I don't think we're alone in that. So I mentioned that I really like plants that work. Um, I love uh, Monarda or Bee Balm um, mm. because it takes up a lot of water. Lobelia cardinalis takes mm -hmm. up a lot of water. Um, and it doesn't. they don't have to sit in water, um, but they can. And so some of my favorite perennials are ones that do that work, right? So I love asters because they, they feed so many insects and the butterflies love them. And I see, you know, night moths and things on them. Um, I like, um, I even like shelter plants like um, Amsonia. A lot of the grasses like Chas uh, Chasmanthium latifolia. What is that? Seagrass, oak grass, oak grass. I don't, somebody check me on that. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing, but it's Chasmanthium latifolia. So these kinds of native um, grasses provide shelter. So mm -hmm. when, you know, a, a bird's coming down, I don't even know where to, a, a bird's coming down and there's a butterfly, they can hide in the grass, you know, to, to save themselves. Um, but it's also nice nesting material. Um, I like a lot of the ferns for that, for mm -hmm. nesting material. I have some under my uh, maple tree out front. Mm -hmm. um, I like... I like three season stuff, but I also like stuff that has good garden bones, which is another reason I like the grasses. Um, not to mention one of my early mentors was Kurt Blumel and he's the father of ornamental grasses in America. So I kind of got that bug early, um, but that is, that is, you know, a very meaningful plant material. Grasses. I think, I don't think they're underutilized anymore. I do think people oh, use right. a lot of grasses, but yeah. You yeah. just can't, it's like music in the garden. When you talk about the bones, you're right. I mean, the way that the grasses, even though there are some purples and there's different colorations and the way that they yeah. turn in the fall, but um, the movement that they create in your garden, every oh, garden yeah. should have a swath of grasses yeah. or multiple. Yeah. In the fall, in the evenings, you can you can hear the circulation, right? The, mm. the rushing noise of them mm -hmm. um, as it moves across. It's just so calming. Mm -hmm. It's just so lovely. Yeah. yeah. Kathy Kathy has a nice um, sorceration too. Yeah. Kathy Jens is agreeing and it's Northern Sea Oats. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> hey, Kathy. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, and what kind of plants, I mean, animals are we talking about with these plants? We said at the top that this is Garden for Wildlife Month. If you're just tuning in, um, we have Heather Wheatley here from Homestead, Homestead's own, and she is uh, education coordinator at Homestead Gardens. And it is Garden for Wildlife Month. And so we're talking about our favorite native plants that will impact the wildlife in honor of right. Garden for Wildlife Month. So who are we talking about here? So um, we're talking about plants that are, uh, yeah, native plants that support native habitat, but also migratory habitat. So native habitat would be things like the squirrels that come. So if you have oak trees and they have acorns, they like that kind of protein that's in there, um, you, the, the hazelnut and things like that, they really enjoy. I mean, it sustains them through the winter. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. um, but then you know, the, the ecosystem that lives around birds and insects is really increased by putting in um, native plants. So if you have, um, you know, nesting type um, material for them, um, and there's all kinds of commercial stuff you can buy that has cotton and stuff in it. But, you know, if you have foliage that's easy to pull, willow foliage and things like that, mm -hmm. they, it provides habitat for them for nesting material. Mm -hmm. um, but all of those kinds of um, native trees um, gather insects. So that's food constantly for the birds. Um, you know, that any, any native um, bird that, that you can support, you should, because we lose them. You know, they, they, if they don't have the things that they need, they're not going to stay. So I saw a, a, a red breasted Robin and he just looked so proud and he was looking dead at me while he was pulling off the Samsara's from the maple tree. And I honestly said to him, it's okay. Those are for you. Yeah. <laughs> No neighbors were out. Thank God. No but it is. You. Take those. Yes. All yes. you, buddy. <laughs> yes. It is amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. um, the way that nature works, when we let it, mm -hmm. the way yes. that 
you know, I had Jessica, what we had Jessica Wallace are on and she yeah. wrote, writes a lot of books about bugs. And yeah. she said, and back to community that one of her trees, and I can't remember which species had been infected with aphids. And a couple days wow. later, all that they, it was covered with this other insect yeah. and birds. And she said the, the tree sent out a signal. It said, help, I'm under it. attack. And all of the predatory insects came in to help and cleaned yeah. up those, those yeah. bugs within no time. And it really does. It's a circle of life. And if you're not planting yeah. for all of the spe you know, all of the species, yeah. you might have more bad bugs than right. you want because right. you're not attracting the birds to your garden. So you're right. really doing right. yourself a favor by helping your garden stay free of the predatory, you yeah. know, free of the bad bugs and more of the good bugs and good birds. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, the, there's this book I love. Um, probably, hopefully most people have read it. Um, the hidden life of, um, the hidden life of trees happens to be right here. Um, this book talks about exactly that, that they send out signals for the things that they need. And, um, it also talks about the communities that you and I have talked about. Um, and so that's a really good book. It's a quick read, but it makes a mark like right mm. here in your, in your coronary cavity mm. it makes a mark that lasts a really long time. So. And we should say Arbor Day just passed um, that's right. the national Arbor Day. I know people in different regions celebrate it in different times, but yeah. um, so we are, I'm glad we're preaching about trees today too. Um, oh, yeah. Karen, well. Karen said she just saw her first hummingbird of the season. Oh, nice. So those nice. lobelia would be good for hummingbirds. Are there any other oh, hummingbird cool. plants that you, I'm sure they like the monarda. Yeah, they do. You For the hummingbirds, they want that proboscis to get in a long tube. Mm -hmm. So anything that has a long tube, like the um, the, the beard's tongue, I'm not mm -hmm. great with that ones. I promise you I'm working on it. But, they, but any of the long-throated yes. flowers, they, yep. love. Yep. they love. But, you know, it's also important... Um, we talk about what plants they need all the time, but hummingbirds need a lot of water too. So it's a good idea to have um, water out. Um, even if you do it for the day and you dump it, if you're worried about mosquitoes, but it's not a big deal to put water out before you go to work and then dump it when you come home. Mm -hmm. They're not drinking at night, but mm -hmm. they need that water. Um, and you know, the other thing too is if you're going to feed the hummingbirds with a synthetic feeder, um, I urge you to just use sugar water, just plain sugar water, um, because the the dyed stuff is it's just not good for them. So natural is better, you know. Offer, offering um, natural yeah, material, yeah. yeah, big big nectaries is a great idea. I know. I saw this thing going around on Facebook this weekend about a hummingbird with his tongue stuck out. Did you see that no, picture? No. It was viral, no. and it said because someone had used honey in their water instead of just oh, plain yeah. white well, sugar. that's going to have a fungus. I yes. mean, they're going to have, yeah, you could have a fungus that it's not used to. And, um, you know, there's um, biotics that just don't make sense for a hummingbird. Right. Not not like that. Yeah. They'll pull nectar out of um, just a natural um, lana uh, hum uh, honeysuckle. Um, a honeysuckle. They'll pull, you know, lots and lots of nectar out of a honeysuckle um, for a very long time. Um, because it, it, you know, it's sweet and it's, it has high nutrient levels, but you can't mimic that with, uh, with honey from a bee. No, so. I, I remember myself spending hours spent taking the honey out of the honeysuckle. Uh, it's just yeah. that one drop in the taste. That is the taste oh, of summer, everything. isn't it? Oh, yes. yes. I don't think I thought about at the time that I was taking it from the wildlife, but Have it's you a right of pass. Yeah, there's a lot. There's You're a lot. Okay. You're okay. You're <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so some for them, some for us. Exactly. So you mentioned earlier something about uh, native trees, and then you have some mm -hmm. understory. Is there a percentage in our backyard? Is there a formula that we should be growing? I know that Homestead is not all native all the time. No. So what's the right formula? For no, our no. And I'm an integrator as well. I mean, um, I do have a fully um, adapted native um, garden, nothing in it is, is foreign. Um, in my backyard, I have some hybrids, but in the front yard where I'm trying to connect to the woods as in, in the causeway, I'm trying to be as responsible as possible. Um, so I, I like a healthy balance, you know, like I do what the planet does. I do what the human body does, right. It's the 70, 30. Mm -hmm. um, I really like that. I take that much 
I mean, I have 30%. Well, to be fair, I probably have 10% lawn, but um, I like... I like to mimic the balance that is shown to us by nature. So heavier, you know, 70% or higher um, of native plant material. For Where sure. did grass come from? Do you know? I mean. Where grass came yeah, from? Yeah. Not well, that kind of grass. The, the grass on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another channel. Um, no, but, but, you know, it's resident here on um, in North America, there are native grasses in North America. I mean, we made brooms out of it when we first yeah. got there, right? So, um, but but grasses are essential as a gram, you know, as a um, uh, something to heal and cool the planet. It was already here. Mm -hmm. but not everything was covered with um, right. with trees. I mean, we did our fair share of taking a lot of trees down, but. Grasses are equal regional. That's interesting. So when we talk about the 70-30, it's not just native versus non-native, but it's the percentage of your, I don't know, I can't remember what the percentage of our country or our world that's covered with lawn, but it's far too greater than that 30%. And oh, so yeah. it's yeah. not just the switching of native, but it's the switching of thinking about your backyards differently and right. not just a place to mow. And I know I've got two little kids. I need, I want places for, I have a swing set, oh, yeah, a trampoline. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, yeah. You need places for your dog to pee. Right. And um, right. so we need some part of lawn pathways, yeah. and interesting, yeah. you know, secret rooms for your gardens. Yeah. So it's thinking about your, not just your plant material, but your lawn to garden ratio right. as well. Right. That's 70, 30. Right. And if you like to look at lawn, um, you know, there are um, Donald Pell, obviously, genius um, landscape designer, architect, um, and um, Dr. Susan Barton also talk about this subject. Um, there are cues of care. So if you want to have a bunch of lawn, just you can just mow on the edge of it yes. where there are going to be pathways and just let the rest grow out almost meadow-like. And if you have cues of care where you're taking care of the edges and things like that, then most homeowners associations, most, most, um, of your neighbors are usually fine with that. Um, yeah. So there are people that don't put in a bunch of trees and shrubs, but there's no reason you can't do a meadow Yeah. instead of lawn. Yes. That's beautiful. I mean, um, I really, have you ever looked at carrots, Pennsylvania? It's like the most charming lawn alternative. It's just this cute little moppy top green, happy thing and you can tread on it. I mean, if you don't want it in the pathway, but you can move around your mm -hmm. property walking mm -hmm. from, you know, carrots to carrots mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and it's so much more interesting. Yes. Yes. That's and true. doesn't require, I mean, back to the natives, some of the reasons that we choose natives, one of the reasons is because they don't require as many inputs from us. So our lawns okay. to That's look right. like the traditional green lawn requires a lot of fertilizer, a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Luckily in our region, we get more water than others, but that's just right. not, not, that's not natural. So no, that carrot Pennsylvania grass will not be as um, needy. Needy, right, exactly, exactly right. Yeah. So Kathy made it, brought up a good point. Um, we asked if you had planted any trees for Arbor Day. Kathy said she got a tiny white native dog tree for oh, dogwood man. tree, but she's not planting it yet because remember we had Dr. Michael Raup on talking about yeah. cicadas yeah. and he said they're really the only damage that they're going to do. Cause I've heard this question a lot and I'm sure you have too, Heather is yeah. what about the cicadas? How can I, you know, how can I protect my trees and my shrubs and my plants? Well, they're really only yeah. going to do that harm to your young trees or your new right. brand new woody shrubs. Yeah. So, and uh, for this long, right? Yes. For a very short period of time. <laughs> so you can it's either wait like ongoing. Kathy, she's saying she's keeping in a yep. pot to protect it from the cicada swarms, or you can net them, but there's no sprays, yeah. nothing you can do to protect Oh them. no. And there's nothing you need to do to protect your older That's right. trees. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, um, and, and for me, I mostly do all of my perennial gardening, gardening um, in the early, in the late spring, early summer. And then I normally plant my trees and shrubs in the fall. Um, I like the soil to be warmer, um, when I introduce new, um, mm. I mean, to be fair, trees are a huge investment and yes. you want them to survive for many reasons, but they really love to put their roots in warm soil first. Perennials are, um, you know, a little less discerning, um, but you do, you know, you do want to water 
the the perennials and things like that. But the cicadas are not an issue for the perennials. Established, right, or established trees. So that's, we want to get that out there now because cicadas are such a hot topic, aren't they? Yeah, they're so beautiful. I mean, if you really look at them, um, they're just, their structure is amazing. Just amazing. So much effort put into, you know, it's, it's wings and it's body color and all, you know, intentional. And, and I know everybody's freaked out, but just when it happens, just take five minutes, even if you have to like, okay, I'm going outside now, you know, whatever it takes, just observe it, observe this natural, amazing thing that's happening and know that if we were too hard on the land, if we disturb, just disturb too much soil, if we did too much, um, you know, uh, construction, um, we didn't have that. So every cicada that comes out of the ground is a gift mm -hmm. because it we had to, for 17 years, you know, mm -hmm. it had to be undisturbed. So the more cicadas you have, the healthier you can mm -hmm. imagine your area is. So wow. it's a barometer and a blessing. That's true. I never thought about that. Never thought about that. Yeah. And you know, that's really, that's really all I have are plants and bugs. Like I'm a terrible cook. I, if I'm driving, you don't want to follow me. That's really all I have. Are plants. Well, <laughs> we're so cook. lucky that you get to share it with us because there's so many people who are oh, tuning in here that are so passionate about plants. So we, yeah. it seems like we're preaching to the choir. So I think that what we yeah, urge good. you to do is go out and share this message too, you know, yeah. uh, it, it scrolled. Serena said, oh no, who was it that shared the red bud? It's too many people chatting. Barbara said she gave two of her friends red bud seedlings. So oh, you're sharing the message, Barbara, and she's had shared Lily of the Valley. So, you know, yeah. it's not, maybe it's gifting a plant. I know on International Women's Day, it was a big deal. We were all now sharing plants with, with power women that we loved, but yeah. it's Garden for Wildlife Month. So who can you go out Go to Homestead, buy one for yourself, one for a friend, and share a native plant with someone, native perennial, or something with someone that you love, and spread this message because you know it's about this backyard park, about creating communities, and gardeners are sharers, right? Yes, yes, and you know once you get, you know, bitten by the biophilic bug, right? You 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 crave it, and you want to be around it, and. Um, if you have a network of other gardeners, I'm telling you, plants that you share grow better, you know, grow better because you don't want to, you don't want to kill your friend's plant, first of all. And they might come over and say, hey, how's that, you yes. know, how's that hey, Lily doing? I'm like, oh, it's, it's growing like mad. And you're like, oh God, I didn't kill it. They, they grow better. But then when you divide that plant that was given from a friend and then it has this legacy of sharing, mm -hmm. I, I think that's magic. Mm -hmm. It is. I and mean, it becomes stories and memories, which is what yeah. we so love about our garden. So, yes. all right, well, tell us a little bit back to Homestead. When we're shopping Homestead, yes. any of the three locations, is there a way we can find what the natives are? Are the native habitat center, are they all in one place? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have ambassadors. So you, if you come into the nursery, every single store has someone or several someones who have been studying um, the mission of the Native, Native Habitat Center um, for over a year and a half now. Wow. I mean, this is a long time in planning. So we had a commitment to it. Um, uh, Brian Riddle, the owner of Homestead, was very invested on getting these teams educated to give the right message, to connect the right people to the right plants for the right place. Um, our passion for soil actually stemmed from um, Brian Riddle's commitment to healthy soil. He's from Anne Arundel County. So, of course, you know, it's a farming state, um, a farming county. And so, um, we started with soil. So if you come into the store and you go into the nursery, there will surely be someone who can help you from the ground up build your native palette. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. go in and ask, or we posted the link to where you can even shop online. Now, what a world we live in. Um, shop from yeah. Homestead's Native Habitat Center or many other choices. So, and Emily is saying, come see me in the nursery. We can talk trees all day. Yeah. Emily, are you at the Davidsonville location? Um, let us know. And we're so thrilled to have you, Heather. This has been great oh, talking. Garden for Wildlife, what a kickoff for the month. Um, is there anything, you know, besides planting, we can share with our, and I'm putting out water. I love that tip about putting out water. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you know, it's important. So, so if you have, if you're bringing in butterflies um, or birds or anything, I mean, that's part of their need, right? And so you want your plant material to provide ecological services. There's just a little bit more to do, right? To give the whole, you know, buffet of, of what their needs are. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Water is a good one. Wonderful. You know, they, um, I would put stones in it too. So I, I don't know if I mentioned sometimes the butterfly, it's the water's too deep. So if you have stones on one side, they can light on the stone and then reach in. So I, this is the first year that I've put out a bird bath. Um, oh, and nice. so I've never done it before. And I see, we have a pond. So that's out front though, out back. Um, mm -hmm. I finally put the bird bath, which my dog also uses now as a water dish. He's bigger. Mine too. Dogs Mine too. And bigger and bigger every day. This, pup, this <laughs> pandemic puppy we got, he just oh, nice. laps it yeah. up, but it helps me freshen up the water, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, for sure. For sure. Well, he needs um, habitat too, right? Yes, right. <laughs> uh, well, Terry's saying that you're a gift to local local gardeners, and we think so too. Oh, thank, thank you, you for sharing with us today, and thank you all for joining in and just sharing your yes. love of thank plants. You, uh, yep. We've got two, lots of people. We've a whole green fisted army here, so that's wonderful. <laughs> yep. um, Heather, you've been wonderful. Thank you for My joining pleasure. us. You too, Katie. Oh, and we'll be back next Monday, May 12th. Heather won't yes. be with us, but she'll surely be watching. So you can thank Absolutely. her there. Um, we'll be back with Gary Polarczyk, who's of The Rusted Garden. Oh, He's nice. another Marylander who has a new book out about growing more with less. So Heather's Backyard Space, a small space that you have, being able yeah. to fit in more vegetables, more native plants, whatever it is that you want in smaller spaces. I think Heather would agree. Mm -hmm. Density is key in creating good gardens. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So we'll be back um, at noon next Monday, but please RSVP. And of course, thank you to all of our Garden Rewards members. We couldn't do this without you. So I'm going to share this cute picture of Heather and her grandmother one last time as we <sighs> sign off um, because it is beautiful and it's a little slice of history. And that was a great story. So we'll say goodbye for now. Bye-bye.